It's become a typical day in Colombia. Three more judges have quit their jobs after being threatened by the murderous drug cartels. The Colombian drug barons, thought to be fleeing their government's crackdown, have made their presence felt with startling ferocity. This is the face of Gilberto Rodriguez Orihuela, one of Colombia's most deadly narcotic dealers, known as the chess player. But as his lifeless body was taken from the prison that he called home for so many years, there was little fanfare and little fuss. Yet this man was one of the most dangerous cartel leaders in the world, and he had left a pile of bodies in his wake and helped fuel the raging narcotics problems facing the United States and Europe. Let's explore how the world's biggest cartel leader died in prison alone. Colombia's drug lords responded today to the government's new get tough policy. They declared war on the government and launched a series of attacks that killed one person. This is the face of the man who waged war on the narcotics cartel lord, Pablo Escobar, and managed to come out on top. Along with his own brother, Rodriguez controlled an empire so powerful that even politicians were not immune to their corruption. But how did this unassuming man build up a cartel so threatening that even Pablo Escobar feared him? His story is both shocking and terrifying. Founded in the 1970s by Gilberto Rodriguez Oyuquela, Miguel Rodriguez Oyuquela, and Jose Santa Cruz Londoño, the Cali cartel originally formed as a kidnapping ring. Among their victims were two Swiss citizens, a diplomat named Herman Buff, and a student, Zach Jasmillis Martin. The cartel are reported to have received 700,000 in ransom, which was then used to help fund their drug trafficking empire. They started as many do, by dealing in cannabis, but soon discovered the low profit rate was not enough to fuel their needs. They knew they could make money from another narcotic, one more profitable, and one that was only just beginning to grip the world, cocaine. Hey, Pasó diciembre, pasó enero, pasó, pasó febrero, eh, en marzo, el 22 de marzo, recuerdo tanto, en eh, 1988, le hacen un allan allanamiento a, al señor Pablo Escobar, a una finca que se llamaba en ese entonces El Biscocho. During the time they were setting up their operation and distribution center, the United States Drug Enforcement Agency, which you might know better as the DEA, didn't consider cocaine to be as serious of a problem as it would eventually become. With that ignorance, the cartel could go almost unnoticed. And so they thrived at the beginnings of their operation, having several independent operations, unlike Pablo Escobar, who kept a tight-knit organization under his rule of thumb. The Cali cartel had five major trafficking groups independently distributing their products, although in times of need, the groups would work together as one. Two of the most successful and powerful members, the Rodriguez brothers, Miguel and Gilberto. Unlike many cartels, they didn't wage war on the police. They battled the other cartels themselves, taking the fight straight to their rivals. And they had big plans for the future. They hire the best chemists, the best economists, the best specialists in the transfer of money. The Cali cartel would become innovators of the narcotics trade, revolutionizing their methods to bring in the most profits while keeping the authorities at bay. At their peak, it was thought the Cali cartel are thought to have controlled an astonishing 80% of the world's cocaine trafficking and would be described by DEA Chief Thomas Constantine as the biggest, most powerful crime syndicate we have ever known. The leaders of the cartel had become very skilled at evading the law by using various different methods. One group sows the coca, another harvests it, another buys the processing chemicals, another transports it, another arranges the wholesale distribution. The drug bosses based here in Cali like to think of themselves as corporate leaders rather than common criminals. As such, they prefer to draw on their billions of dollars in yearly profits to corrupt the police, judges, and politicians rather than killing them. According to the brothers, they even financed political campaigns, including in 1994, when they allegedly put up the money for the Liberal Party president, Ernesto Samper. He has denied having any knowledge of these donations at the time. <laughs> It was not long before the cartel expanded into Europe, and they intended to take on the world. Every year, about $7 billion in drug money returns to Colombia. 
Drug barons now own about one-fourth of Colombia's best farmland, assets hidden with the help of frontmen. And Cali is booming. Gilberto and Miguel Rodriguez have a piece of several hotels and own Cali's largest shopping center, according to U.S. drug officials. And they own Cali's main passion, the soccer team America. The authorities would begin to close the net as this cartel had a target on their back and were being hunted by more than just the law. They had Pablo Escobar out for their blood. And with that began the Cali Medellin cartel war. It lasted between 1998 and 1993. Their feud was over the trafficking rights of Los Angeles. The battle was brutal, with notable massacres and assassinations, such as the Monaco bombing of 1988, the assassination of Gustavo Gaviria in 1990, and the Cali soccer field massacre later that year. The two cartels began negotiations that would secure the rights to the narcotics trade. Gerardo Monsada, one of the heads of the Medellin cartel, was executed by Escobar, accused of stealing. But this was one of Escobar's biggest mistakes as his widow, Judy Monsada, turned to Gilberto and Manuel Rodriguez and asked them for help. Together they formed Los Pepes, a death squad which was specifically created to take out Escobar's narcotic labs in an attempt to get the upper hand. Although the Rodriguez brothers opposed the violence that came with their roles as leaders, they saw it as necessary evil, especially after Escobar bombed the wedding of Gilberto's daughter. This started a bloodbath between the cartels with Gilberto furiously demanding anyone associated with Escobar to be eliminated. Between 1992 and 1993, the Los Pepes unleashed hell on the Medellin Empire. Behind the scenes, many were asking why the government had not interfered in the violent outbreaks. This led to speculation that the Los Pepes were somehow sanctioned by the government. Eventually, the Cali cartel would win the war and become one of the biggest cartels the world had ever seen. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration has put Gilberto and Miguel Rodriguez on the top of their most wanted list. But here in Cali, they've not only become accepted members of society, they're seen as leaders of the business community. During an operation where mercenaries were hired to take out their rival Escobar, the helicopter the mercenaries were using crashed into the mountainside en route to the hit. And that hit became a rescue operation. The Cali cartel would not have to take out their main rival as the police would end Escobar's life in a shootout and his cartel would collapse, leaving the Cali cartel to pick up the pieces and take over where Escobar left off. But by the early 1990s, the net was closing in on the Cali cartel with narcotic seizures taking around 75%. In fact, the operation against them was huge, with 91,855 case hours and 13 years in investigations, eventually seizing 50 tons of cocaine and $50 million in assets. By 1995, there had been six arrests, including Gilberto Rodriguez, who was arrested while at home. His brother was also arrested a month later during a raid, and the Cali cartel leaders were finally behind bars. Gilberto was sentenced to 15 years incarceration, but was released after seven. But this arrest would not be his last. In 2003, he was arrested again. This time, the United States would push for extradition, and the Colombian authorities would grant their wish after it was discovered that they were still controlling their empires from the inside of their prison cells. In 2004, Gilberto was sent to the United States to answer for his crimes, and a year later, his brother followed. They were both found guilty and handed lengthy prison terms. He was to serve his sentence at a federal prison in Butner, North Carolina, and it was while he was incarcerated that he became ill, and he began the process of trying to secure an early release. Físicamente un poquito maltratado, sí. pero espiritualmente bien, ¿sabes? His release was set for 2030, but despite his ill health, a judge denied early release in 2020. During his reign, Rodriguez was often romanticized by both the Colombian and the international press as highly intelligent and something of a gentleman. He was known to quote poetry and preferred running his legitimate businesses over his dealings with the narcotic side of the cartel. He would continue to fight for freedom, hoping to live out his days in the care of his family. One of the world's major cocaine kingpins won out of federal prison because he is in poor health. Cali cartel co-founder Gilberto Rodriguez Orejuela is asking a Miami federal judge to allow him to return to his native Colombia and his family. The 81-year-old says he's suffering from prostate and colon cancer. He served about half of his 30-year sentence under a 2006 plea deal. He would never see freedom again, as in 2022, 
1982, he succumbed to illness and died in his own prison cell. After rumor and gossip, his own family confirmed his death, telling reporters, the children and wife of Gilberto Rodriguez Orihuela regretfully informed that yesterday, Tuesday, May 31st, 2022, at 6.54 p.m., our father and husband died of a lymphoma. This dangerous cartel leader who had terrorized the world with a narcotics empire died alone in his cell without any of his luxuries he enjoyed on the outside world and was removed from his cell like any other criminal. Many cartel leaders managed to escape justice and live out their lives in freedom. But when the Cali cartel began to unfold, Gilberto Rodriguez would face a prison sentence that would eventually cost him his freedom and his life.